Hello and welcome to this uh, lecture on Sundar Ramaswamy's reflowering. So, uh, in this lecture, I'm going to see how exactly this uh, story is plotted um, to begin with, and then let's see the importance of this idea of reflowering as well. Sundar Ramaswamy is a very, very important figure in Tamil literary tradition. He was uh, born in 1931 and he died in 2005. He is affectionately known in literary circles as Su Ra. He edited and published a very famous magazine called uh, Kalachuvadu and he also wrote in many genres in the Tamil language. And according to many critics, he is, he is one of the most versatile and innovative of Tamil writers and a great modernist and a dazzling stylist. And we can see examples of his uh, writing style, um, his innovation in even this story in question for this week, uh, Reflowering. Some of his uh, novels that have been translated in English and have received much acclaim are these. Urupuli uh, Maratin Kadai, it has been translated by Blake Wentworth in 2013. J.J. Uh, Kuripukal, uh, this was translated by A.R. Venkatachalapati in 2004. And Kurandegal Pengal Angal Children, Women, Men, uh, this was translated by Lakshmi Holmstrom. So, all these translations have received received a lot of critical acclaim by the reading public. Now, uh, Adur Gobalakrishnan has um, this criticism to offer about uh, reflowering. He says that reflowering is a witty, engaging and enormously positive story. A very humane story that brings to mind the fact that while a machine may increase the efficiency, it can be no match to the thinking, feeling, caring human being. So, this critic Gopalakrishnan uh, brings out the two contrasts that are uh, played out in the story, which is between a human being and a machine, how um, the machine tries to replace the human being and um, that does not happen ultimately in the story. And he is also quite right to state that the story is witty, engaging and it is enormously positive because despite um, uh, so many ego clashes, people do come to the rescue of one another at times of need. So, this is a very um, affirming story, a heartwarming story, one that um, readers would want to go back to again and again. Now, uh, I want to begin with um, the title and um, look at the uh, implications or the significances of the title for the story. So, uh, what exactly is reflowering? Reflowering is something um, to do with uh, a flowers blooming again, one that flowers or flourishes again, something that is rejuvenated, uh, brought back to life. Once, um, once um, the spirit, uh, one, something that uh, that has its spirit restored. Um, so these are some of the uh, associated meanings that this word reflowering has, blooming again. Um, you know, uh, coming back to life, coming back into one's own once more. So, what is the importance of this title? What is hinted at through this title? So, um, if we look at the central character, then this concept seems to say that the reflowering of the spirit of Ravata is what the story is all about. So, Ravata is the central character in the story. So, what is the story? What is a story? A story is a set of events um, and um, this set of events in reflowering happens around Rauta, a blind man who makes bills at a clothes shop. Um, and this character is very, very interesting because he is blind. That is the most uh, uh, visible marker of that identity for some of the readers. But what is even more interesting uh, about Ravutar is the fact that uh, he is a 
with, uh, with mathematics. In fact, he is a genius um, and the entire clothes shop is dependent on his uh, extremely fast calculation skills. So, he can add up um, so many different items and make the bill um, quickly. Um, within a bat of an eyelid. So, which is why he is much sought after by the owner of the shop. Um, so, uh, and the other interesting uh, marker of identity about Ravata is this, that he is uh, in deep trouble financially. So, he is a blind man, he is a maths whiz and he is a man who is perpetually embroiled in financial troubles. And the other thing that we need to note is that Rauta is conscious of his value to the shop. He knows um, how much wanted and desired and important he is because he is the one who does the bills at the till. So, uh, because he is conscious of the fact um, that he is very important when he is displaced, uh, displeased, he will not show up at work. So, displeasure means no show at work and that is very interesting. So, uh, the owner of the shop um, because uh, he is dependent on Ravata rescues him financially when uh, there is trouble at home. But he feels that Ravata does not uh, show enough gratitude even though he is uh, saved by the owner of the shop who pays his debts, uh, saves his house from being uh, uh, auctioned. So, and the mm, owner of the shop ultimately what he does is he gets a calculator from Bombay for the first time and this uh, introduction of the calculator affects Ravata mentally, he just collapses and then um, he is unable to work and because he thinks he is being replaced by this particular machine and but what happens is that um, he recovers when everybody realizes that he is not only great at mathematics, he is also powerful in remembering things and um, he knows where things are, he knows the prices of each and everything in the shop, he can even sense the presence or the absence of a particular person, he remembers dates, he remembers um, particular anniversaries and so many other things and everybody realizes that he is is indispensable once again and he becomes promoted or he promotes himself as the um, manager of the clothes shop. So, this reflowering, this idea of reflowering of Ravata is about reinvention. When one of his identities fail to perform, when one of his identities uh, is replaced by a machine, he just reinvents his identity as a, um, as a man who is uh, supreme at remembering things. So, he uh, becomes very superior, he continues to be superior in the shop because of his um, uh, because of his cognitive skills and he gets his promotion at the end of the day. So, we have seen the story, we have seen the story as a set of events. So, now let us look at the plot of the story. Now, what exactly is plot? Plot is uh, uh, about relationship between the events, between the sequence of events and we need to look at the significance of the connection between events and we also need to consider the thoughts, behaviors and actions of character that kind of move the, that move the plot along long that move the plot forward, complicate it and resolve it. So, we need to see the connection between events and, uh, and about the characters who do the navigation of the plot. Let us look at the events and how they are interconnected. And I want to begin by uh, examining the opening scene, the scene with which the story begins. And I would call this particular scene as a very, very uh, deceptively calm scene. Um, we have uh, two characters, uh, Amma and uh, the narrator, uh, being introduced in the opening scene. Amma was lying on the cot, and I was curled up on the floor. 
We were late risers and had earned that privilege after fighting for it for years, as ours is a family that believes in rising early. For generations now, we have um, bathed before sunrise, but then Amma and I were invalids. Uh, Amma had asthma and I suffered from joint pain, both of which could play up early in the morning. So this scene um, is about a mother and a boy uh, who are late risers. They get up very late in the morning and they have perfect cause for that. They are invalids. Um, one has asthma, the other has joint pain, joint pain and therefore ex they are excused for from getting up early in the morning even though their family has this tradition of uh, getting very early before sunrise and bathing before then so uh, this is a, a domestic uh, situation a, a description about a particular domestic uh, um, family and um, this is a very very calm scene uh, as i just mentioned and um, the narrator, the boy, uh, through whose eyes we see the story, uh, describes his father, Appa, who is about to leave for work at his clothes shop. So he, Appa, the head of the household, is um, getting his keys and he is um, getting ready to leave the house. And, and these are the set of things that happen when he is uh, about to leave the house. There is the jingling of the bells of the horse um, buggy that's waiting outside the house and then there is the noise of the slippers, the queech queech sound when he puts the slippers on and then he opens and closes the umbrella in, in order to test its um, uh, quality. Uh, that He calls it the daily umbrella health test to make sure it's in perfect working order. So these are the stereotypical set of things that happen before the father leaves the house and this particular day um, too the boy expects the same uh, set of things to happen but it doesn't um, and we can see a description of the father being given by the boy uh, who kind of sleepily looks at him uh, early in the morning and we get this description. I see him in profile, one eye, spectacles, half a forehead streaked with vibhuti and a dot of chandanam paste, golden yellow, topped by a vivid spot of red kumkumam. So uh, the father is all uh, ready, you know, he is in perfect uh, order. Um, he has had his puja, which is uh, quite evident from uh, the sacred ash and, um, and the chandanam paste uh, and the red kumkumam on his forehead. So these are um, the details. These are um, the uh, stuff that are used for religious and social purposes in a Hindu household. So the father is all set to leave the home, but he doesn't because there is an unexpected expected turn of events. So instead of leaving the house, the father uh, wakes up his son, the boy who um, uh, covertly um, looked at his father in the previous um, uh, scene. So the, what, is, what is the issue here and the issue for the first time becomes clear and that is that uh, Rauter, the man who makes the bill at the clothes shop hasn't turned up for work uh, and uh, he wants his son Ambi the boy to go to Rauta's house and bring him back. So the, the calmness of the uh, scene slightly begins to crack. There are fissures in the scene and the boy doesn't uh, get up readily enough and then the mother and the father they wake him up um, uh, and then uh, Amma asks why um, why do you uh, keep on with this farce? Can you or can you not manage without him? Why do you have to carry on this um, habitual uh, fashion of insulting him and then begging him to come back? And she says, this farce has gone on far too long, she said, making up one day and parting the next. And the father is riled. He says, Onam is around the corner. You can come to the shop and make the bills. He shouted immediately. I mean, um, from calm to uh, strong, there is a quick uh, turn of events. Anger twisted his uh, lips, slurred and flattened his words. And she asks, um, is Ravita the only person in this whole world who knows how to make bills? Asked uh, Amma. So she's quite insistent. Um, and then he replies, just shut your mouth. So 
we get a lot of information when we see this exchange happening between the husband and the wife and is witnessed by the boy. Let us see what these uh, information are. The first thing that we note is the temperament of the father. He can easily get riled. He gets very, very angry very, very quickly. And um, we also understand that um, Rauta has a massive ego because um, if the father is displeased and shows his displeasure to the employee, he refuses to come to work and that is also evident there. And then we also see that the mother becomes the mediator when something um, goes wrong between the owner and the man who makes the bill. As we see, the boy tells us, the boy who is the narrator and witness to the events in the story, he tells us that the mother um, is the one who, uh, who kind of, um, you know, gets the uh, crisis solved in this particular case. Let us see how. So, the boy Rauta visits the home of um, uh, the boy Ambi visits the home of Rauta, and that particular scene has a particular uh, agenda. It establishes the financial instability, the poverty of Rauta. And um, how does it do that? Uh, through the description of the environment and the house of Rauta. And what sort of a house is it? It is a tiled house with a low roof. Uh, in the front yard, there was a well on the right, its parapet wall, stark, unpainted, broken, so not in good order, uh, not well maintained, no money to maintain it. Um, velvet moss sprang around it in bright patches. Um, there is a contrast between the nature that uh, envelops this well, the parapet wall and the actual state of condition of the wall. Stone steps led to the house, a strip of, a strip of gunny sack, uh, a, sp a strip of gunny sack curtained the entrance, a sack is used to offer privacy to the members of the household. And even though he is very, very poor, the manner in which Rauta sits in the middle of the house almost expecting company tells us that he can be the Lord. He is the Lord of his um, surroundings. So, Rauta was sitting cross-legged legged like a Lord and um, he invites the boy. He is very welcoming. He asks after his um, mother and he also talks about um, you know, natural remedies that he has which he could, uh, which could solve her um, problem and the Amma's asthma problem. And he really wants to be called back to work. That is also quite evident. And when um, the boy tells that Amma is uh, apologizing for the behavior of um, the shop owner, the husband, uh, in, um, Rauta immediately accepts the apology and then he says, Amma, you are a great woman, get up. Uh, let us go to the shop at once. So, this is uh, directed to the boy who has come to pick him up. So, uh, what is very interesting about this particular scene is the idea of Rauta as a lord, the metaphor of a very powerful person and the lord of his household is underlined or highlighted in this particular scene despite his financial troubles. Now, in terms of reading the plotting of a particular story and some of the questions that we need to ask are about the conflicts. What are the various kinds of conflicts in a particular story? Uh, what sort of conflict is it? Um, are the conflicts physical conflicts, intellectual, moral or emotional? And if there are uh, these sort of conflicts, how are they resolved? How are they solved or sorted? And uh, how are they resolved? By whom? So, these are some of the questions questions that uh, tell us about the nature of a particular society represented in a story and um, the identity of the characters who cause trouble and the identity of the characters who help resolve or solve the troubles in the story world. And um, the other general question that you can ask is this, is the conflict between good and evil sharply differentiated? Are these uh, easy to identify and compartmentalize or is the conflict more complex and subtle? So, these are some of the questions that you could ask and uh, the other question is what is the nature of the crisis? What sort of crisis it is? Is it easily identifiable and who is it caused by? 
So, these are some of the questions you can ask in terms of reading the plotting. Now, in terms of this particular story reflowering by Sundara Ramasamy, uh, what are the conflicts in this, in this particular story? So, I would suggest that the conflicts are primarily financial conflicts and uh, the financial conflicts create other sets of uh, conflicts uh, in, in, uh, as if it, there is a domino effect in the story. So, let us look at the first crisis in the story. The first crisis which led to Ravata going uh, back home in a huff is about uh, borrowing clothes from the clothes shop on credit. On credit. So, Ravata wants to get a set of clothes for his family on credit and he does not get due permission from the shop owner. So, he just asks the shop assistant to pack the clothes that he has selected and kept apart. So, that really riles the clothes um, no, shop owner and he says, uh, I cannot give you any further credit. So, this is the first crisis and um, the second crisis is, uh, is um, that the house of Rauta is about to be auctioned. He is unable to pay the debts on his house and uh, his uh, house has come to the uh, auction. So, uh, all his family members um, and the women of the family, they come to the clothes shop in a cart and uh, they wail in front of the clothes shop. So, that is the second crisis. And the third crisis happens when um, after the clothes shop owner has um, paid off the debts um, on the house and um, the very next day the um, Ravata instead of coming to work at the uh, usual shop, he goes and works at a rival shop. That is when the third crisis happened and that is because he says that the Chetiar um, to whose uh, workplace that he goes to make um, bills, he has apparently promised him that he would pay off all his debts. So, there are a set of financial conflicts connecting all these um, important events in the story and these financial conflicts turn into emotional and moral conflicts. One thing turns into another. So, as I said financial conflicts have emotional impact because uh, in the process of uh, sorting and settling them egos are hurt and um, in the first uh, case we can see that the woman becomes the mediator, the uh, mother of the boy becomes the mediator and uh, her apology uh, is accepted by Ravata and he comes back to work and uh, it is very interesting that he refuses to come until there is an apology from the uh, family where he has been um, insulted. And in the case of the second um, or the third crisis, the shop assistant Kolopin is the one who brings him back from the Chetiar's house where he works. So, um, it, 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 there is also a pattern here. We, we see Rauta being collected um, back, um, brought back to the clothes shop um, and he, we also need to remember that he is a blind man who needs to be uh, guided to the shop where he works. So, that is also something that we need to remember the physical inability to find his own way is also very interesting. Now, uh, when Ravata goes to the Chetia's house, um, the Chetia's shop to work instead of coming to his own uh, shop, he says what injustice, I have just come back after paying the court the entire amount for his debts, he has let me down the ungrateful wretch, uh, Appa shouted. So, he cannot believe that uh, Ravata could betray him to this extent. He has sorted all the financial worries that are associated with the house. He got the house back for this man and um, the next day instead of coming to work, he has gone to a rival clothes merchant's shop. Um, so, he cannot um, understand this betrayal, this treachery 
and, and we can see how financial troubles lead to emotional conflicts. So, he is hurt by the actions of Raut. And uh, the reason as to why he goes to the Chetia shop, as I just mentioned, is because he has more financial woes and Chetia understanding the financial troubles of Raut exploits the situation and asks him to uh, come and work at his shop instead so that um, he could use the um, calculation skills of this uh, blind uh, man and uh, he also promises him that he would uh, pay all his um, debts. Now, um, in that particular scene uh, when uh, Kolipin tells him that um, Rauta has gone to work in Chetia's shop, um, the father is uh, um, very, very upset and angry and that is the reference there um, in the story and Kolipin, the shop assistant also whipped himself into a fury. He also gets angry on the shop owner's behalf and he says he, that is Rauta knows how to calculate but he is an idiot. He can be superior in terms of his mathematical ability but in terms of um, uh, leading a life in the real world he is an idiot, he is a stupid person. And um, this is a wicked world, he said. This is Appa, the owner of the cloth, uh, clothes shop. These days, you can't even trust your own mother. He is so very upset that he says even uh, um, the figure of the mother can never be trusted these days, uh, in these fallen days. And then finally, Kolopin brings him back. And once he's back, Rauta says, I just lost my head. I lost my head, I uh, said Rauta, as he stood before, um, as he stood before the owner of the shop. Um, at a, a time will come when you will be cut down to size. Um, the owner of the cloth shop is very upset and he uh, wants that you will uh, get your due when the time is right. And um, Rauta says, uh, please don't make such comments. Uh, it, it, it is um, very, very upsetting. So, uh, this uh, situation, this crisis in the story uh, tests um, the cloth shop merchant's faith in humanity. So, he says even um, you, you can't trust your own mother. So, uh, it is interesting to see that the figure of the mother is used as the touchstone for everything that is pure and full of integrity. And um, uh, again, uh, Kolopin, as I said, in increases the intensity of the situation by uh, his own anger uh, at um, Rauter, who has gone to work in a rival shop. So, um, this seems to be a wicked world where there is no uh, sense of gratitude. And uh, again, the invocation of the mother figure also reminds us of Rauta's evocation of the mother and uh, it is her intervention there that brings him back to work uh, in the first case. So, there are lots of um, uh, connections here. If you, you read a passage very closely, it will lead you to other places and to other memories and you can make uh, certain thematic connections um, through these associations. And again, uh, there is foreboding and forewarning in the words of the um, owner of the shop when uh, very upset he says that you will be cut down to size one day uh, and that warning does come true that foreboding is realized when um, the shop owner causes um, the downfall so to speak briefly of Rauta when he introduces um, the calculator from Bombay and um, the ego of Rauta is uh, um, upset and destroyed uh, when the calculator comes into the picture. Thank you for watching. I will catch up with you in the next session.